Welcome everyone uh, to our coffee talk. It is May 7th. Um, it's hard to believe that we're already into May. That is unbelievable. Um, looks like most people are staying home still and safe and uh, thank you for doing that and looking out for our North Country businesses and community. Um, as a reminder, we will uh, be recording this session uh, so we can share it after the fact uh, for those that weren't able to join today. Uh, with us this morning, we have members of the Bowers & Company team, including Matt Mager, Nate Carroll, and Lori Podvin, who will be talking about the Paycheck Protection Program. And they will be providing an update um, and overview of the guidance that has been put out through the SBA on the loan forgiveness and answer any questions you have. But before we get started this morning, I do want to give a quick shout out to our local banks and uh, credit unions for working day and night for our businesses and helping them with getting the funds they so desperately needed during these trying times. Hundreds of businesses across the North Country have been able to continue um, and stay open with your assistance. So thank you so much for all of your hard work and dedication to our communities. It's, it has not gone unnoticed, so thank you so much. So without further ado, I am not an expert by any stretch of the imagination on this topic, so I would like to hand it over to Matt Mager from Bowers & Company. Thank you, good morning everybody, thanks for having us. Um, looking forward to talking on this topic. Um, so the Paycheck Protection Program brought to us through the CARES Act um, is, is basically a 100% federally guaranteed loan program. Um, and it's eligible for small businesses that were in operations starting uh, before uh, February 15th of 2020. Um, small businesses, non-for-profits qualify, sole proprietors, um, independent contractors are eligible. Um, and primarily small businesses is defined as 500 employees or, or less. Um, the loan calculations, as many of you probably know if you're participating in the program, is calculated based on your average monthly payroll uh, multiplied by 250% to come up with your eligible loan amount uh, up to a maximum of $10 million. Um, the loan can be used for and should be used for eligible costs such as payroll costs, um, some payments of interest on real property and personal mortgages, uh, rents, utilities, and things like that. Primarily the purpose of the loan is supposed to be used 75% for uh, payroll costs. You know, the payroll costs, we're talking about compensation, so wages, salaries, commissions, and, and other compensation forms. Uh, paid time off is allowable. Um, uh, payments for uh, health benefits and other type of benefits, such as retirement uh, benefits, where the employer is contributing, uh, are also eligible. And then some, some state and local taxes would be eligible uh, you know, for the calculation and the, the loan forgiveness. Um, uh, ineligible costs or things are primarily uh, individuals that are capped at a $100,000 annual salary. Um, so if in your loan calculation when you were going to get the loan, you had to make sure that uh, officers and employees' wages were limited to $100,000. Uh, it's going to be the same for the loan forgiveness uh, when we talk about that as well. Um, so the cover the certification of the requirements for the loan um, and the eligibility uh, is a good faith certification um, that the loan is going to be used to primarily support payroll and what are called covered expenses. Uh, the covered expenses are things like payroll, interest, uh, covered mortgage obligations, rents, and utilities. Um, the covered loans are, there's no guarantee to them. Um, there's no collateral requirement. Um, it's a non-recourse uh, loan, and there are no uh, SBA fees associated with it. And there's also a uh, six-month deferment period 
to start payments uh, once you receive the loan. Um, and the loan is, a, if not used, or 100% forgivable. Uh, it is a two year term note at uh, half of 1% uh, interest. Um, so there are, for the loan forgiveness, the general uh, calculations for the loan forgiveness are, um, you have an FTE test, um, and there's two periods that you can use. So we're, we're looking at the eight week covered period, and we're looking at the average FTEs in that period, and we are comparing them to your test period. And there's two test periods that you can, can use. And the test periods are February 15th, 2019 through 630 of 2019 to calculate your average FTEs. And then uh, an alternative test period would be 1-1 of 2020 through 229 of 2020 uh, as a test period. Um, and, the, and the FTE calculation is used to determine how much of the loan will be forgivable. And so if the FTE average drops below your test period, your loan forgiveness is gonna be limited to, to the amount, uh, your percentage uh, is gonna be reduced by the drop in FTE percentage. So that's a, a key thing that we need to look at and you should be assessing um, as you progress through you know, using the loan and, and basically you know, strategizing on how to get the maximum loan forgiveness. Um, also, the loan, the, the loan eight-week period starts when you when you receive the funds. So on the first disbursement of the loan is when the eight-week period will commence. Um, I think it's important that you know we communicate with our, our lenders and make sure we know what the lenders are going to require. Uh, for the loan forgiveness um, and, and what kind of documentation they're going to need to make sure that when, when, they, when they submit the loan application for forgiveness, that they're going to have all the pieces that are going to be required by the SBA. And I know that the, the lenders have gotten some guidance from the SBA, although it's with this program, it seems like it's ever changing. So we get new updates daily. Uh, things came out last night and they have been coming out since uh, you know, about April, the beginning of April, when this whole program really kind of kicked off. Um, I think the, the key thing with the loan forgiveness to, to, to understand is the 75% rule. So that money that you receive is, is, is supposed to be used for 75% of the money is supposed to be used to pay for uh, payroll costs. That is a key thing that needs to be understood. Um, the concept, I think, behind the, the, the PPP loan was to try and get funds to the uh, individual small businesses to give them liquidity to be able to retain their staff uh, and pay them during this pandemic. Um, and, and so the government, I think, was trying to, to push that money out as, as efficiently as they possibly could, and they felt that there was you know, the, the, the employees were established with their employers and that they could get the funds to these individuals quicker and it would help not overload the unemployment system. Um, I think it worked to an effect, uh, but at the same time, I think that, you know, a lot of businesses, you know, the, how quickly it was rolled out, they were, they, they did lay some people off. Um, I think it, it helped tremendously, but I still think that people were a little hesitant to not lay people off because they didn't know with the uncertainty what was going to happen. So now we've got employers rehiring people back that are getting these loans uh, to try and qualify or to make sure they qualify for the payroll uh, forgiveness piece of it. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the, the program in general. Um, I think that, um, you know, we We'll, we'll take questions, and I'm sure there's some specific questions, and we can get more into the details uh, of the loan forgiveness itself and how the calculations and things like that are going to work. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so now's the time for our guests to uh, please submit your questions. 
and I'll read them out loud so everybody can hear that and then uh, we'll get answers to specific questions and if you have specifics um, you know that's not sharing private information of course that you don't want shared publicly um, please feel free to submit those asking for a friend Yes, you can say asking for a friend and that means it doesn't have anything to do with your business. So, <laughs> and while we're waiting for questions, go ahead. Um, you know, as our businesses are getting these loans, you know, they're, New York isn't open up. They're like, oh, we can't work. You know, I can't call my people back, you know, but I think the premise as Matt mentioned is when you, your clock at this point as of today, eight week period starts when you are when you have your loan proceeds so you have to go under the current law on that so you know it's a matter of people bringing it you know it's supposed to be alleviating taking people off from unemployment bringing them back onto your payroll uh you know and then some employers say well you want me to pay people you know i don't have anything for them to do well i think in essence that's what you're doing you're you're bringing them back on with the hopes that once we are up and running when they open it up, then you know you should be able to move on easier um, than it than waiting. Um, also, if you wait, you know you're probably not going to meet the criteria uh, for the loan forgiveness. So um, I think that's one of the you know at least with our clients, you know that they're struggling with you know well I don't have any work at this point we're not open, um, but I got my money for my PPP. So that's something they need to be mindful of. Um, sure. So we have a question. Uh, if you did not originally check the box to include rent on your PPP application, can you still use the funds for that if the company covers partner and if the company covers partner medical, is that a justifiable expense through the PPP? I would assume yes and yes. Um, you know, yeah, I, I would agree. I don't, I, I, we haven't seen anything that says that exactly what you checked on your application is what you, you, you know, your, your specific things that you can use it for. Um, we, we have not seen anything to that effect that I can recall. Um, and, and as far as um, health benefits, when you say a partner, I'm assuming we're talking about a partnership. Um, in most cases, you know, I think that those health benefits are deductible on the individual personal return. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it, you know, I think that, that what Nate said is it may be true, but I think we're going to have to get some further guidance on what exactly, where that would be includable. Um, but it certainly is a, is a benefit uh, and part of the, part of the costs that are, are eligible for forgiveness. One thing we could say for sure on that is there is part of the FAQs here. They talk about your $100,000 cap on compensation. And it specifically says in the FAQs that if an individual's benefits are what pushes them over that threshold for the $100,000 in compensation, that that will not matter. In other words, compensation is strictly payroll or for a partner. We're looking at it really as self-employment income. And benefits on top of that are not part of your overall cap on that. Which is no different than an employee. You get to cap if an employee is over 100000 with salary, you get to add the benefits, including retirement um, and insurance also. Okay. Um, there is a concern with employees on unemployment not wanting to return and thereby affecting our ability to hit our full-time equivalent requirement for forgiveness. The SBA issued FAQ number 40 on May 3rd regarding good faith effort to rehire employees in documenting that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's the federal government punting. It's almost them saying that you have to be the bad guy. That's my opinion of it. Um, you're certainly gonna wanna document. I think it's a form letter uh, to a lot of employees that says we want you to be back at this date we're going to pay you, whether or not you're working, even if you're sitting at, on the couch, we're going to pay you X number of dollars per week. Here's the rate, here's the hours we're guaranteeing, even if you're not coming to work. If an employee refuses that offer, I think the FAQ is making it pretty clear. 
then they are also essentially voluntarily terminating their employment. That's not a good position to be in. You're not going to have happy employees uh, with respect to that ruling, but that's the intent of this program is to not have people on unemployment, to make sure that businesses are paying them the payroll. So I think that it, what the SBA said on that particular topic is very much in line with the congressional intent of the bill. I, I would agree. I think it, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it they, they understood that some employees were not going to want to come back and be rehired. And I think that this was a way to kind of give the businesses the ability to document that they've offered their job back. They're willing to pay them in, in accordance with the program, but the employee is refusing for whatever reason. Um, and, and so it shouldn't hurt the employer for that FTE calculation and I think that documentation is going to be key in, in, in making sure you have that in the records so you can support the fact that they would, they would otherwise be rehired. Okay. Um, this question is regarding the, the tax portion. Uh, I have heard that the IRS is treating the PPP forgivable portion as grant income and is therefore taxable. Has there been any clarification on that? That, that's the IRS's clarification. Um, a couple senators, it's in the news today, a couple senators, Grassley, Rubio, a couple of them have got together and proposed a small a bill that's essentially, I think, only addressing a narrow issue, which is they want to reverse that decision by the IRS. So that's up to Congress, though, to, to get done. So I. Right now it's taxable. So the grant. Yeah they're saying is non-taxable, but the expenses are non-deductible. So you can interpret it that the grant's taxable up to your loan forgiveness amount. Right, right as of today. Could change the market. Yeah. Sure, well, I think it's Im important to share that this stuff is constantly changing. So this is as of May 7th information. Right. That's correct. Okay, um, I'm unclear on the cash tips or their equivalent portion of the eligible costs for reimbursable payroll. We are doing takeout and employees are receiving tips. Why would that be reimbursable? Claimable tips, right? Yeah, claimable tips. It's claimable tips, yeah. And I think the concept here is for wait staff uh, to make sure that in the forgivable piece, you can pay them an additional above and beyond their regular hourly wage to make up that tip income that they're losing out on. So I think the intent is to, to be able to get forgiveness if you, you know, if you knew what your average claimable tips are per server, you could add that in addition to what their hourly wage rate would be as a server, and that would be includable for the forgiveness piece. Which should run through payroll anyways. Correct. So, you know, you're gonna have to, provide your documentation for your payroll. So you want to make sure that that's, you know, your payroll is reflected properly. So when you turn in your 941s or other payroll records, that's on there. Okay. Uh, next question. So the full amount of your loan must be used within the eight week period, even without actual work. Submitting office expense receipts up to 25% and copies of payroll receipts should be enough for the loan forgiveness. Yes, uh, we're, you know, yes. I think that, uh, again, the SBA is going to be giving guidance to the banks, and the banks are then going to obviously require certain documents. Um, right now, it, it, what, what I've seen from the banks and from the SBA is that, yes, they're going to want payroll records. They're going to want proof of FTEs. Uh, they're also going to want uh, receipts for utilities, you know, invoices and bills for utilities. They're going to want to see leases potentially for rent payments to support rent payments. So there's going to be a definitely a documentation requirement because they have to submit it to the SBA to make sure that they can, that the, it is eligible for loan forgiveness and you're going to want to make sure all that stuff is in order and ready for them to do the submission. And also those like your utilities, like you can't prepay, you know, it has to be your monthly bills during those eight weeks. So there's no prepayments, you know, trying to, push everything into the eight weeks to qualify. So it's gotta be the actual expenses for utilities. All right, that individual uh, has a follow-up. My concern is that 
We're paying people regardless of the amount of work that they're doing. And then if the loan is not forgiven, we have to pay it back. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, that that's that's the risk that's associated with it. But as long as you abide by the rules, um, you know, and you're using 75% of it for payroll, um, and you can document that, and you can document the other eligible expenses, then based on the way the program is written, it will be forgiven. Okay. Uh, next, um, do the employees that you bring back, uh, do they have to be the original employees or can you hire other workers so long as you get them back to the full-time equivalent numbers? You can have replacements. That was an easy one, good. Um, if our revenue has remained relatively stable, will we still be able to convert any part of the loan to a grant? It's based on expenditures. So the criteria for loan forgiveness is based on your expense side, your FTE side. So it's not based on the revenue side as of today. I, I think a broader concern too is whether um, you really needed the money, whether or not you had an uncertainty, but we don't really have, the SBA has essentially come on and said, yeah, if you, if you reevaluate at this point and you feel that you did not have an uncertainty, you're welcome to pay the money back by 514. In other words, essentially a week from today. Right. Um, we don't necessarily have good guidance on what that would be. And I think for a lot of businesses, even if your revenue has been consistent as of late, might you have a lull in collections several months from now? Right. Or, I mean, for some longer business cycles, I mean, if you're selling insurance, you might not really see an impact until people start renewing their policies a year from now. And uh, maybe their payroll factors and uh, revenues have gone down, so, you know, you're getting less on that policy. I, I think it's a very kind of nebulous test that they're giving you with respect to what an uncertainty is. But it is something that I think everyone should take seriously and evaluate. Yeah, the economic uncertainty, could it be now, could it be in the future? You know, obviously everyone's affected and the timing's not gonna be the same for everyone um, based on their, you know, their business operations and receivable collections and, and a, a number of different factors. I also think the liquidity question is also out there about, okay, how much money can I have in the bank and still be eligible? Um, and that hasn't been defined. So I think there's some things that the SBA has said here that, uh, they're, that they're going to review. The SBA intends to provide additional guidance on how it will review the certifications prior to May 14th. So I think it's kind of to be continued to determine you know, whether or not you were truly eligible. And I don't think they define that real well. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're waiting. Okay, uh, as a nonprofit, we voucher for our work from contracts, but we are not getting paid quickly. Can we use the PPP to pay people now and still have that forgiven when the voucher funds finally come through? Now that goes back to your grant. So with our not-for-profits that have grant, that grant base that's for reimbursement, they need to go back to the grantors um, and determine the use of those funds, if they can defer those funds, you can't double dip. You can't say, okay, I'm using it to pay now and then later on, um, you know, I'll use my grant dollars for others. So you gotta, it really goes back to the grants first. So that's kind of the catch with the not-for-profits. You know, you, you can't be double dipping here. Okay. On March 20th, we laid off three people and reduced hours. However, our full-time equivalent increased in April after we got the PPP funds due to seasonal inspectors returning to work, not those laid off. Will, though, uh, will that not count against us? We've also increased hours for some that were reduced, but not all due to the workload that will, will that count against us? I think on this one, this is something that you just gotta do the math on. With respect to those, those base period, there's a test period, full-time equivalents, which we know is the eight weeks, essentially following the loan origination date. Um, the base period though, you actually have two options. You can measure your full-time equivalents between 2-15-19 and 6-30-19, or you can measure your full-time equivalents between January 1st of 2020 and February 5th, February 29th of 2020. 
So you have to do both. You just have to. The law actually states that the borrower can choose which test, which base period to use for full-time equivalents. Well, you're going to use the lower one. So you need to do the math on both periods, figure out what that real FTE number is going to be for you, and then plan to hit that number. Yeah, I think another problem with the, this is that full-time equivalence hasn't really been defined. Um, we've got multiple, you know, scenarios or, or multiple possibilities of what a full-time equivalent is. Is that 20, 80 hours a year, which would be 40 hours a week? Is that a full-time equivalent? Is it 30 hours a week? Is it 35? So, and then I've seen some that's kind of said, said it might be a headcount. So, um, you know, I think, again, that's something that kind of we're waiting for further guidance to really determine um, what a full-time equivalent is going to be um, and whether or not uh, it's even going to be an hours test or is it going to be kind of like some test where we're looking at payroll returns and saying, okay, the average FTEs in this period was X and in the covered period, the payroll tax return said that they had this many people employed. So um, I think that we're just going to have to wait and get some additional guidance on it and, and the definition of what an FTE exactly is. There are worksheets out there. I know we had some for our clients um, and it's really a budgeting. So we're encouraging and we're helping our clients to do that right now. You know, so let's plug it in based on where you are today, where you think you're going to be to show you, okay, there's a potential here under current law where you're going to uh, have to pay back part of this loan um, or you've met the criteria. So then it's kind of a planning tool also um, to maximize your dollars and, you know, get your people on, you know, and you can pay your people more money. You, you know, there's a, you can't pay them 25% less, uh, but you can certainly pay people more. So I think it's a, a planning. You, you don't want to be waiting until week eight to be looking at this. You should be looking at it right from the beginning. And to Laura's point, using, you know, if you're using 40 as an FTE calculation, you're planning and later it becomes 30. You know, you'll you'll have planned better than the actual the actual FTE you know calculation. So, you know, I'm advising moving 40 at this point in time for the planning purposes. And then if it, it turns to be 30, well, then we you know we, we're being on the conservative side of it. Okay. Um, what if you don't use all the money in the eight weeks? Can you return the remainder or keep a portion? Yes. Yes. So you can do both? You can give it back? Or you can keep it and you'll have your loan that you'll have to pay back. Yeah, so you have a two, a two years to pay it back. So you can pay it back anytime within that two year period, obviously it's interest bearing um, until you pay it back in full. But it's only 1%. So it's 1%. Pretty good deal. Great, great deal. Great. Uh, which state taxes are allowed as forgivable as payroll costs? We think it's only SUDA state unemployment tax, which can be found on like your NYS 45 um, or, the, or in your payroll journals. Yeah, it's not going to be state withholding tax would not qualify is our interpretation. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a someone who's saying there's a challenge um, in that they've accepted loans based on certain criteria. And if they disperse the funds through payroll and then they change the parameters as a business owner, are there, is there any recourse on following the original guidance? No. <laughs> I, so, I think you just follow the guidance yeah, as it is today. I don't think it, it's, is it going to get more restrictive? Um, you know, I think we just got to follow day by day and monitor it. Yeah, I think that I think that there was a way that it, the legislation was written, and now we're see. So what happens is the legislation is written, and then you've got the interpreting body, whether it be the IRS or the SBA in this case, they come up with their interpretation, and that's where the litigation comes into on the back end is because the the the, the what was the legislative intent, and when they interpreted it, the the rules that they put in place was that really what they had intended. And that's how you get all the, the, the lawsuits and things like that and the differing of opinions. And that's where you get the court cases. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some, 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 some lawsuits and, and some, some litigation uh, come about from all this. We hope not, but I think it's inevitable. 
All right. Uh, is there an application to apply for forgiveness? What is the process to apply for the, the forgiveness? Do we go through our bank or is there another solution? Through the bank. Through the bank where you receive the loan from. Because they ultimately hold the loan. Um, they are the, um, I'm not sure, what, what would you call that? The, the bank that they, they actually issued the loan. So they're the holder of the note. And what's going to happen is, they hold the note and then they ask for forgiveness from the SBA. So they have to have the documentation in place to ask for the forgiveness from the SBA. Um, and if it's not forgiven, then they are going to hold the loan and collect the payments on the loan. Um, they're, they're not at risk because they, they, it's federally guaranteed. So, but they will be servicing the loan is the, is the terminology I'm looking for. So your bank is the servicing agent of the loan. Unless they sell the loan on the secondary market, which you're also allowed to do. Good point. So, but that'll be after the fact, probably. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I would recommend that anyone, they just need to talk to their lenders. You know, no different than the PPP application just to get the loan. There were some differences in the banks or credit unions on what they were actually asking for. So, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the banks. So, you want to follow whatever your bank is asking you. Um, for documentation. And I think one of the great hopes here is that when they do come out with the final um, guidance on debt forgiveness, I know a lot of banks have already clamored for or requested, can we get a standard document upon which we, you know, we can all agree or that the SBA has at least said, this is how we're going to report the debt forgiveness. Similar to the application process, we did eventually get um, a standard application that all the banks used. Um, I think banks are encouraging or would like, I don't see why they wouldn't, a standard form on the back end as well that walks you through the steps and the documents needed uh, to apply for forgiveness, but we've just not seen it yet. So, you know, it's a fluid situation. We're waiting for that piece along with the other debt forgiveness guidance. Okay, thanks. Um, how should we account for the PPP funds when we receive them? Should we record it as a loan until the end of the eight weeks? Is it then considered a forgiven loan or do we need to change it to grant income? I would say it's a loan. I mean, it's a loan until it's forgiven. So Correct. they should record it on their books as a loan. And then once you determine your forgiveness piece, then you will record that as we were telling our clients it's other income because mm -hmm. at this point it's not taxable however the expenses aren't deductible, but um, we'll just see where that goes with that. But right now, until you get the approval from the lender that it's forgiven, it's a loan. From a book standpoint, it would be considered other income, um, just not taxable income. All right. Um, if you indicated, oh, sorry, the thing moved. Um, if you indicated one of the test periods for the application, but realized that you had lower FTE from the other period, can we switch the period? For the loan forgiveness? Yeah, because you haven't done the loan forgiveness yet. So, um, you know, you can determine, you know, which one benefits you the most and use that as your test period. Are they actually asking, um, like they use the prior year 12 months, but they're a seasonal employer. Because a seasonal employer can use any consecutive 12 weeks, but they probably already got their loan. I guess. Yes, yeah, so we need a little bit more clarification on are we talking about for the loan forgiveness or are we talking about for the eligible amount for the application? I'll see if I could follow up on that. Yeah, also, you know, when people applied for their loans, you know, they did the best they could. Some people did it on their own. They might have left off some eligible expenses. So maybe their loan amount was, could have been more. And maybe in some instances, maybe they overestimated based on what the regulations were at that time. And maybe they received more loan. So I think your loan is what it is. Now you go through the process to meet the criteria for loan forgiveness. And if you're short, you know, then you'll, if your loan should have been more or you could have had more, then you'll probably make it easier for you to uh, have more for loan forgiveness and vice versa. So I think, it, you know, whether, whatever your loan is, it is what it is. And now you need to follow the criteria to meet the forgiveness. 
Okay. Um, could you provide some clarification on whether the SBA is looking at the liquidity of businesses to determine if loans will be forgiven, even if the original requirements for forgiveness were met? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we're, we're, like I said, they said uh, up, uh, so before May 14th, they'll be kind of hopefully defining eligibility and we're hoping in there they'll give us maybe some liquidity requirements. Um, and and uh, we'll just have to wait and see because it wasn't well defined in, in, as it was written. Okay. Uh, to plan to hit the FTE, on what date is the comparison made against the base period for forgiveness? And after that date, could you lay people off again if business levels do not support it? So I, I, I think what you're asking is after the eight week period is over, and if we're not back to, to, to quote unquote normal, um, or back to full, full time, you know, working and things like that, can you then lay people off? Um, there's nothing in the legislation that I see that says you cannot do that. So I would say yes. Um, if you obviously, if your business is not viable, um, given the new you know conditions, then you certainly it's up to you to to lay the individuals off if you need to. There is another piece of this kind of backstop rule, which again we need clarification on, but it says essentially that even if you don't hit your FTE calc during your eight week test period, if you rehired or, or I guess we'll say, if you've returned to that level of employees by 6.30, um, you're gonna get some kind of, it might not matter. Right. Um, we, we don't really have any guidance on that though. So I, I think at, at least 6.30 is a date out there where um, you're gonna wanna keep your employees on until unless, unless someone knows something I don't. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think that um, I think that the, the whole premise is to, to keep your employees on the payroll, uh, rehire them back if you got the, the money to do so, and that's what the intent of the loan is for, and to pay those people through the eight weeks. After the eight weeks is over, I think it's up to you. It's a business decision as to whether or not you can keep them on or you need to lay them off because you don't have the liquidity and the capital or you don't think your business is going to be viable at that point. Okay, uh, there was some clarification um, provided, I think, um, on that question earlier. It says, I think the question was, if I used X period to calculate my loan and get the maximum loan, can I later use Y period instead in my calculation for forgiveness if it gets me a lower FTE? Yes, yes, yes. So, so your, your loan forgiveness is based on the two, the, the dates that, that we gave you. And the two eligible dates are uh, 215 of 19 through 630 of 19 or 1120 through 22920. So those are your, your eligible test periods, unless you're a seasonable employer and then it's a 12, uh, it's a, is it a 12 week period for the, for the loan proceeds? For the loan proceeds, but not for the, uh, for the loan forgiveness. So the, there's only two test periods for a loan forgiveness, the ones that I just gave you. Um, 215.19 through 630.19 or 1120 through 229.20. Okay. Uh, the PPP funds were deposited into our payroll account, but expenses other than payroll are paid uh, from, from our operating account. As long as we document why funds were transferred from payroll to operating to pay those expenses, that should be sufficient, correct? Correct, correct, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to separately segregate the funds into a specific account and only use them for specific for the, the PPP covered expenses. You can have it all in your operating account, but you just need to document it with payroll documents and invoices and things like that for the covered expenses. Okay. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, please submit those in the chat function. And Matt, uh, Lori, or Nate, do you have any? kind of wrap up thoughts as we kind of close out um, this session. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. No. Yeah, I think it's ever changing, you know, as you can see, and I think if you've been on top of this, you've seen that, you know, it's a, uh, it's a work in process kind of thing. And uh, I just would tell you to just 
try and be, you know, stay on the information the best you can, get some guidance if you need help. And, um, and you know, just monitor things and, and as things evolve, just stay on top of it because knowledge is key in this and, and especially in this process to make sure you're getting the maximum loan forgiveness. Yeah. Right now there's two stages. The first stage was getting the loan and getting the max loan you can. Now we're into the next phase of the process and that is how do we maximize loan forgiveness? And I really think that you need to either fully understand it or get to somebody that fully understands it to be able to, to maximize that. From a computational perspective, the determining the loan amount um, was easy. Determining the debt forgiveness amount is going to be much more complicated based on all the various guidance that we're receiving and essentially the, the disagreements that we've got on that. So um, it's, you have to do the math up front. You have to know coming into the end of your eight week period. I advise all my clients that at least at the one month mark of your loan period, of your test period, come to back to me and let's look at it. Yep, I'm doing the same with mine. Yep, we're kind of monitoring it, so we're planning it. So like anything, we're trying to, to see where we're at and to, to try and maximize the loan forgiveness and make sure we're going to be. And we're giving clients projections and, and saying, hey, you know, here's the loan you got. This is what we're projecting. You're going to have the loan forgiveness because not everybody is able to rehire everybody back, you know, be based on their business operations or whatever it may be. So we're saying, hey, this is your potential payback that you're going to have to, to account for and keep aside. So I think that plan is a very good point very key to this process. Yeah, and to remember that this loan is paid back over a two year period. So, you know, when times are tough and cash isn't coming in, and if you're not on top of this and you then get to the end and say, wow, half my loan that I've already spent to just survive um, is not gonna be forgiven. And now you're gonna have to pay that back over two years. So, you know, again, just to really be in front of it and, uh, to monitor it to make sure that we can uh, hopefully help you get the most forgiveness or you know so reach out to your people sure we did have one last question i want to make sure we're ba we're answering as many questions for people as we can if we hire additional staff can that be part of our forgiveness if we are exceeding our full-time equivalent yes yeah mm -hmm. if it's payroll yeah. okay great well, thank you so much uh, to the Bowers and Company team. Again, um, you know, all of the accounting professionals, same as the banks are up day and night learning this guidance as it comes and it's rolling out very quickly and they are learning it as quickly as possible to help clients across the North Country region. Thank you to our banks and credit unions again for helping our businesses. Uh, if it weren't for both of these entities, uh, we certainly wouldn't be able to move forward um, with our you know, reopening phases as we move forward into that. Uh, so we thank um, the banking institutions, credit unions, and certainly, certainly our accounting professionals. And a special thank you to Bowers and Company for joining us this morning on our coffee talk on uh, sharing uh, such great information. I know there's a lot of questions that are coming in regularly uh, to each and every one of you and your staff members. So we appreciate you taking the time this morning uh, to join us and, and help the businesses in the, in the region. So uh, with that, I think we will close up the meeting. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Uh, thank you again for joining our coffee talk on Thursday, May 7th. Have a great day. Thanks, Thank you.